Hey, welcome everybody. Let's talk real estate. Your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current commercial real estate market here in Southern California. As we take a no BS look at both sides of the issues driving this market today to find the best solutions going forward. With our man right in the middle, Barry Saywitz. Hey, Barry. Hey, good morning, Paul, and good morning to all of our viewers and our listeners out there. It's Tuesday. We are back again. I'm Barry Saywitz, president of the Saywitz Company and managing partner of Saywitz Properties. And we are going to talk a little real estate today. I'm excited about today's show. We've got, a, I think, what's a spectacular June day coming in here in Southern California. Well, we've got the June gloom in the morning. Uh, we expect sunny skies and warm weather this afternoon. With that said, I want to welcome our guest, uh, Yara Charlie, who is the Director of Luxury Leasing at the Adam Kerman Group at Christie's International in Los Angeles, which is a mouthful, but Yara, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And just a correction, it's the Aaron Kerman Group. Aaron Kern, that's it. I don't want to mess it up. He'll throw stuff at me if I ever see him. Um, and so... Uh, your group is based in Los Angeles, and uh, your group is also uh, the cast and the stars of uh, Listing Impossible, uh, which is a reality TV show which talks about and deals with uh, luxury leasing and difficult properties, and I'm going to guess some difficult clients along the way, uh, in addition to the day-to-day -day aspects of you dealing with uh, the normal side, if there is one, of uh, selling homes and, and luxury estates in, in Los Angeles. So I want to start with sort of rewinding for a minute and talk about how you originally got into uh, the real estate business. Sure. So my story is super unique. I moved to LA for this industry. I may have heard of it. I was an actor. I hear they, they do movies and things here. And so I came to LA specifically for acting. I come from a family of actors. My grandfather was a very famous actor. Both my parents were actors. And so I came to LA with that in mind and slowly but surely, you know, I got parts here and there, but it really wasn't clicking for me in the way that I wanted. And I, I booked a few bigger roles and I took that money and I saved it. And I thought, well, let me invest it in something smart. And so I had a friend who was a real estate agent and I thought, Hey, you can sell me a house, right? How hard can it be? Well, he sold me this house and he was a great friend, but just not a very good realtor. So I ended up doing a lot of the research on my own. And I thought, you know, I really have a passion for this. I have an affinity for this. Um, let me see if this can be a day job if, you know, while the acting kicks in. And before I knew it, uh, it became a full-time career. And within the first, I would say, I think nine months, I was the top new agent at my Sotheby's branch um, back in 2008. So that's how it started and it continued and snowballed into a really wonderful career. And I used those entertainment contacts that I had cultivated and really that beget my, my book of business to start. And, and you got into the real estate business in 2008, really not a good time to get into the real estate business. Yeah, in the no, there, were, there were a couple challenges then I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I, I joke and say, you know, when you don't know any better, you just assume that this is the industry that you chose, right? And so I just put one foot in front of the other and was like, well, I'm just going to make it happen because I felt like if I can do it in what a lot of people are considering a down market or a crash, then, wow, it's going to be amazing when, when it's a good market. And so that's really the attitude that I took. I mean, my first I think my second year, I, I joked, I was like the short sale king. I think I did like 30 short sales in one year, which for Beverly Hills, for LA, for the areas in which I work, that's a lot. And uh, I just, I, it was educational. It was great. All of my first transactions were hard. So I felt like I was uh, gaining a base of knowledge, which was really important. And that I just kept building on throughout the years. Yeah. And then you, you don't know any better. So when an easy one comes along, it, it sounds really easy. And, and also in a difficult market, it weeds out a lot of the, what I'll call weekend warrior realtors and people that really shouldn't be in the business in the first place. And it leaves the serious, uh, sophisticated people that know what they're doing. Yeah. We have a lot of those because I think especially, I would say, especially recently in, in I would say the last like five years, I think because of the advent of reality television, there are certain shows that you watch that make it seem really glamorous. We roll up in our $200,000 cars and sell multi-million dollar homes before lunch, you know, and right. it's so, I mean, it's so great and there's so much money. So people think that's what we do. And, you know, look, it, it, it's that, it's a little bit of that, 
but it's a lot of hard work. You're working 24 seven. And a lot of people don't understand that that's the case because they have this idea in their mind that it's something different. And, uh, you're right. When, when a market is tough, it weeds out people who just can't afford to do this full time. Yeah. And nobody likes to talk about the deal that blew up in the 11th hour or the commission I got screwed out of, or the 12 offers we had to put in to try and get one or how we got outbid. That, that's not exciting stuff. The stuff you see on TV is like you say, all the glamorous uh, and the snippets of, uh, you know, what people want to see and want to hear, but the day-to-day -day stuff is a grind. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. No, it's abs you're absolutely correct. And I think as realtors and as people who work in this field, it's an amazing job. Um, you can affect your own income. You can make as little or as much as, as, as your heart desires, really. Um, but there's a lot of factors that go into it. Early in my career, I remember I... Um, this is See, there's parts that nobody tells you, right? So you think like, oh, this is all like, you know, I'm just going to make a bunch of money. But nobody tells you that literally... You do not get paid unless a transaction closes and you could be working your butt off for 30 days, 21 days, 45 days, whatever your time period is. And if something goes sideways, boom, that commission is gone. Early in my career, I learned that hard lesson uh, to never calculate what you make or what you're going to make on a deal. Yeah, uh, I'm married to a, I'm married to a financial planner. So <laughs> early, hopefully there's uh, a solid head on her shoulders and a little more yeah, voice of reason. Uh, early on, it was, it was a, a headache because, you know, it would be like, well, tell me what, what you're in escrow for so I can calculate what you'll make at the end of the month. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that because it's not certain and it could change. And early in my career that I remember there was a month where I was set to make over six figures on a couple transactions and within a span of 48 hours, all three of them fell out. Yeah. And, and that is the way of the world. It, it goes full swing. It, it, some of them are easy and you take them. And then the ones that are difficult, um, you know, the, they make up for it. It's ebbs and flows. There's no question about it. So how did you get involved with the Kerman group and with Christie's uh, and what was the entree into that? So Aaron Kerman and I, the president of our team, had been friends for many years and uh, socially. And so he, he knew of me and my work. And like I said, I was with Sotheby's and then I transitioned to a, a European brokerage called Engel & Volkers in Beverly Hills and was one of their first agents in the Beverly Hills office. And so he said, hey, why don't you come work with me? I'm starting to form a team. Um, but it was very loose at the time. And... Uh, we were, I like telling this story again. It's kind of fun. We were out and about and we may have had a couple cocktails. And again, he was asking me, he's like, when are you coming to work with me? And I said, tell you what, if you remember this conversation on Monday, I'll have lunch with you and then we can talk about it. And he did. And we did. And, uh, I joined his team and that was probably, wow, like seven or eight years ago. Now all the years kind of blend in after a while, but I was one of the first agents as part of his sort of small collective. And we were originally with the John Arrow group, which got bought by Pacific Union, which then got bought by Compass because Compass sort of bought everything. And we were their luxury division at Compass for uh, a few years, several years. And then were approached by Christie's to take over that moniker and be the official Christie's brokerage in Southern California. And for the type of houses that were known for, Christie's is sort of the perfect luxury uh, pairing which is really great. Yeah. So, and they have a long history in whether it's the auctions or whether it's the luxury branding, if you will. And so the focus, uh, I guess on a daily basis, uh, for your group is really the luxury homes. And from a geographical standpoint, I'm assuming you could go wherever you want, but is the majority of the work in the Beverly Hills surrounding areas, uh, Malibu and, and some of those higher end, uh, demographic areas. We are definitely known in those higher end echelon homes. I think the statistic, if, if memory serves correct, uh, last year, 2023, of all the homes that sold over $10 million, I think our AKG sold 50% of them. And that was pretty, I mean, that, that accomplishment is, is really amazing. In terms of sales, we're the number one luxury team in Los Angeles, the number one in California, and the number four team in the country. And that's in a you know down market in terms of of last year, 
And so when people think luxury, they think our team, they think Christie's, it's a good pairing. I sell all over Los Angeles. I started my career in West Hollywood. My office was on Sunset. And uh, then we transitioned to Beverly Hills. And that's sort of the base, but I sell everywhere. So I was joking the other day, I was showing property in Malibu, went to Studio City, went to Hollywood Hills, went to West Hollywood, back to uh, the Hollywood Hills and then downtown. <laughs> yeah, that's a full day. And if you, day. And, and that's impressive. If you told me you didn't hit traffic at all during the day, that would be even more impressive. But I know that's probably not the case. Mm, then I would be lying. And I feel yeah. like this, <laughs> this is about reality. I, I hear you. So, and, and so that is miles and hours in the car. And then hopefully you had some good music and you were making a couple of calls along that, the way. That's how you pass the time. I joke in Los Angeles when people say like, how can you deal with traffic? I said, you know, you just, you have to have, you have to have a good car. It has to be comfortable, have to have satellite radio or a podcast that you can listen to that you can sort of Zen out or, um, you know, if an, uh, you can roll calls and, you know, kind of have a mobile office at the same time. Yeah. So, um, with the luxury side of things, it, it really is. And I know you, you've done uh, quite a bit of work with first time home buyers and, and really all price points, but I guess let's talk about the luxury for a second, because the market has slowed down in terms of transaction volume, just as the economy has sort of been struggling along. And then with higher interest rates, do, do the interest rates, does it really have an impact on a home that's $10 million or more? Or are those people typically just writing a check and paying cash? Uh, both actually, because what, what LA is, is something unique and I don't want to go off into this tangent, but just to kind of lay a little background. So as I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, and you know, about a year and a half ago, a measure was passed ULA, which levied a four and a half to five and a half percent tax on homes above 5 million and then above 10 million. And just for context in April of 2023, excuse me, March, they sold somewhere around 146 homes north of $10 million. In April, they sold two because of this levy tax. And uh, it's in the courts. It might be on the ballot to get repealed, but it's really changed the landscape for luxury listings. Uh, and that's only LA County. So places like Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, Malibu, those are exempt because they're incorporated cities. So it hasn't affected them in the same way. Um, but at the end of the day, when interest rates are higher, what a lot of wealthy people were doing, you know, when you see celebrities buy $60 million homes, uh, they're not writing a check for $60 million for the most part, or they weren't because what they would do money was cheap. So they would take out a loan and they could put their money into the market and be earning five and a half to 6%. So why borrow it when money was cheap? Now it's changed a little bit, but to be honest with you, a lot of the higher net worth individuals, um, the private banking has some amazing rates for them, depending on where they house their money. So people are figuring out a way to kind of get beyond that. But at the end of the day, there's also a lot of wealthy people who just write a check. Yeah. And, and uh, for them, it really is another form of investment in addition to, you know, it's a home. Uh, right. You read about and you hear about this celebrity or or this sports figure bought this home and then they sold it for two or three or four times what they paid for it. Some of that's the mystique of buying somebody famous's home. Some of it is a function of fixing it up and improving it and making it nicer. And then some of it's a function of the market is still higher, but I, I find, and I'm curious cause you're in it every day that the number, when you get above $10 million to some degree, there is some logic and method to the madness, but in others, it becomes just an emotional kind of a thing. What's the difference between a $20 million home and a $25 million home? And, 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 I, and so when you guys value stuff and you meet with sellers uh, on that basis, how do you come up with the number? So, I mean, traditionally what realtors do is they pull what are called comparable sales, right? But when you're, when you're pricing a property in that echelon, there's only a handful of homes that are going to compare, right? So you look at like what's going on the market, you look at what you can price it for, you look at what they bought it for, what do they put into it, et cetera. And then there's a whole other level of conversation that goes on, which is, look, um, is this the kind of situation where they have to sell? Is it the kind of house that, um, that they're, you know, you have a conversation with the business manager, look, you, you might not, you're not gonna sell it for 40. It's, it's really closer to a, a 28 
million dollar house and how does that affect their bottom line and where can they write it off again that's not my wheelhouse that's obviously i'm not a cpa but those are conversations that you have you know at the end of the day it's all a numbers game for these people because this house might be one in a portfolio they may have longer goals and so this is just sort of a cog in a larger machine if that makes any sense yeah i think when you are pricing one of those larger homes you have to take into each of those homes are specific. Like I've been in homes, <laughs> you can tell you're a little jaded when you walk into a $25 million home and you go, mm, it's, yeah, right. it's not that great. <laughs> I live here. Oh, it's all right. It's fine. It doesn't move me. Yeah. And when you see homes where you walk into and you're like, I need to leave immediately and play the lottery because I must win this house. Yeah. Like just like that, the certain homes have feels and a lot of it is architectural design. A lot of it is warmth. I'm a firm believer, and this might be a little new agey, um, homes have an energy. You know, if people were happy there, if that home was designed well with, with warmth, even if it's sort of a modern piece that might, by its nature, have colder materials, if it is done well and the craftsmanship is good and the energy is good, that house will sell. And in LA, we're blessed with these wonderful things called views, which logic goes out the window out the window so if someone sees that and they're emotionally attached to that and they can make it happen they will yeah and, and so i guess let's shift gears a little bit uh and you talk about the first time home buyer market you talk about entry level homes when the market was hot and rates were cheap there really was a frenzy of i hold my hand up and then i've got you know 10 or 15 or even more offers uh and people were overpaying for those houses just trying yep. to get in is that still the case anymore or is it a really different ball game today? Um, yes and no. And the reason that I say that is when that was going on, you know, I, I love what I do, but for that good year, which was, let's say, call it 20 to 21 ish. I, I told my clients, it's like the hunger games. Like we would put offers out at extraordinarily high numbers above asking. And I would tell my clients, I said, look, as your realtor and friend, I have to tell you, on paper, this house isn't worth it. Yeah, You're buying this house because you want to get in the market and you want this house. And hopefully you're paying the price this house will be worth in two years. So you have to go in with the mindset, like you cannot flip this in three years. You're gonna have to hang on to it for five to seven. So, you know, we play, we played a numbers game, but it was not a fun time to be a realtor. Not, a, I had a lot, I, I have a degree in psychology and I joke around that my degree didn't go to waste because I use that psychology degree on a daily basis, kind of keeping people away from sharp objects. But during that time period, it was really rough. And now I'm noticing that we don't have the same feeding frenzy. However, because of low inventory, because of prices still being high and because interest rates being at what is now kind of a 25 to 30 year high, uh, homes that are priced well, homes that are done well, um, sell like that, multiple offers. Uh, again, one more example. I was in the Hollywood Hills showing this, I mean, it was a gorgeous house, but it would have been price per square foot, a record for the area. I'm like, this, this can't possibly be. But I walked in, I saw the house, the view was just awe-inspiring and the workmanship was amazing. And I told my client, he's like, well, it needs to sell for less than that. And I said, it's gonna sell for more than that. And it's gonna do it this week. And he's like, you're crazy. And I said, no, 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 this house is special. Sure enough, the next day, four offers gone over asking. No rhyme or reason. And then there's other homes that you see that I find are amazing that are decently priced that sit on the market. It's really hard to prepare listings. It's really hard to predict what the market is gonna do right now. And so I, I find that uh, on the buyer side, uh, there's a disconnect between what they want and their perception of the market. And I, I'm curious in your daily, you know, dealings with clients, you, you certainly would need to use the psychology degree because you're trying to make people understand that while the perception is that interest rates are high, transaction volume is low, I should get a deal. In some yeah. instances, you're not, there, there's no deal, right? You should either do it, or I guess we just keep looking and kicking the tires and wait for a guy who's really desperate. There's part of that, but it's 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 a very interesting. So I, I work with really wonderful seasoned mortgage brokers, and what I, as a realtor, as, as my job in this kind of market, um, I have to figure out a way I can get my buyers into the home, 
And oftentimes that is working with a mortgage broker who has a product, like a buy down product. I find them a lifesaver. They literally saved all my buyers last year because what we were able to do, and, and again, not to confuse your audience, but a buy down product is where a credit is offered at the, uh, they're in as part of the contract from the seller, but that amount is built into the loan. The lender puts that aside to buy down the interest rate. So like the first year, for example, you might, you might be paying four and a half percent. And the concept is that within a year, interest rates will drop and then you can refinance into a lower rate. Right. And usually it's built out over three years. So at the first year is four and a half, the second year is five and a half, and then the third year it's six and a half. And so, been, and so the perception is even if rates don't come down in the next six months, which I, I doubt they will at this point, uh, dramatically, then you still have time to, uh, until it really fully kicks in and you're back at exactly. a number that sort of pinches, right? And you have to figure out a way to work buyers through their hesitation and frustration regarding interest rates. When I bought my first home, my interest rate was seven and a half percent. And that was considered really great at the time. Um, we were on a goodie train of one, two, three percent for way too long. The Fed should have just gradually raised things. So people got used to that. And now it's almost like um, taking people off a full sugar diet, like their doctor has said, sorry, you're home you're diabetic. You got to cut this out. And so now you're kind of force feeding them this other food, this other product. And people are getting used to it and adjusting their budgets and adjusting expectation. Because uh, two years ago, someone who could afford a $2 million house at that interest rate can now only, only afford a house that's about 1.2. And that's a vastly different house. Right. And you to like really work them into going, you know what, we can still find beautiful things. It's just not going to be what originally you thought in your mind. And if, so you're, and if you're renting and you continue to rent, your rent keeps going up. So you're just wasting money. Exactly. Exactly. So as a realtor, I really have to think of ways out of the box to not only make sure my buyers feel comfortable, but getting them into a product they want and like, and at the same time, still getting them to understand prices haven't gone down, but we're up from last year. So there's an appreciation still. And we're all, of course, you know, waited on bated breath for feds to potentially cut interest rates, which I think even if they do a little bit, it gives the market a little bit of hope. I mean, uh, almost every financialist I spoke to at the beginning of the year thought by March, we'd have at least two to three cuts. Obviously that has not yeah. happened. And so we're kind of hoping we get some soon. Yeah, and I, I find that people's perception of where they think the market's going has a tendency to drive uh, decision-making and expectation. So whether they drop it three or four times, if they do one, people go, oh, okay, it's coming, right? And and then I'll go with your plan, which is I think it's going to be lower over time. Uh, the dilemma is you're still buying it at today's rates. Uh, the good news about the residential market for those folks out there is you can uh, refinance and the cost yeah. to refinance is minimal in the realm of your transaction, regardless of the price point, as opposed to a commercial property or an apartment yeah. building or a retail center that will have a prepayment penalty or, or some other uh, significant amount of fee to the lender, which makes it a little bit cost prohibitive to do that. And residential, you can, you can flip around. Yeah, exactly. And again, like I said, if you're working with a product that has a buy down, that amount has already been worked into your loan. So if a refinance comes, that's not something you have to pay for. So there's no additional costs for the buyer. So I think that also adds a sense of comfort if you're in the right product as well. And, and from the seller's perspective, I guess, if you're talking to the seller, it's look, this is how we're gonna get this house sold. I'm gonna get you a better price by you basically making the guy's payment a little bit less. And even if you give them a credit, then uh, I don't wanna say it's 100% of a write-off, but you are taking it off whatever your profit potentially would be in the transaction. I mean, it seems like it's a win-win. It is, and what we've been doing is like, let's say if the house was a million dollars and we needed a buy-down of 36,000, the offer would be a million thirty six with a thirty six thousand dollar credit. I see. Fortunately, fortunately, because of 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 uh, housing values, we haven't really been running into appraisal issues. And of course, you cross that bridge if you get there. Um, but that's been really effective. So that way, the seller still gets their price, the buyer gets what they need, and over the life of the loan, thirty six thousand dollars is not much. Right. You know? So, so what are your expectations for going forward? Uh, of the assumption that maybe the Fed will drop it and eventually they probably will, but uh, who knows when, 
do you see between now and the end of the year with the election coming uh, and with the economy still kind of bouncing around and inflation high, do you see the market changing much or is it more the same expectations over the next six months? I really don't see it changing much. And this is kind of what I'm telling buyers and sellers. Like we're, we're sort of at, at this, like it's not, you know, uh, yes, I can talk to you about statistics, about certain neighborhoods and, you know, year to date and where we're at and all that stuff. But the feeling on the ground is things are pretty stable, um, that things are sitting on the market a little bit more. So sellers are willing to have conversations about price where they, you know, a year ago, they weren't necessarily doing that, which is a good thing for buyers. Um, one would say, you know, is this the buyer's market or a seller's market? It. And I'm like, it kind of depends really. Uh, if you're a buyer that has the money for the down payment and, and can, can put a significant amount down. So your debt to debt to loan, uh, is, is pretty low and it's affordable mortgage payment. The ball's in your court. You can have conversations. If you're a seller and you have a good product and you come on the market and price it well, you'll find a buyer. So it, it's, it's sort of both. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting time to do what I do because there's so much calculation that goes into it. And I find that the fact that there's still low inventory because there's really no new construction, there's no big flood of like in the recession where you had properties going back to banks or people really uh, in pain that needed to get out. I, I don't find that that's the case so much because people who did refinance and have low interest rates their fallback is, well, I'll just keep the house and I'll stay living there and I have a good interest rate. Um, and so the deals become people who have to make uh, a transaction and have to make a sale. But it, it, the inventory, I don't think, is going to increase dramatically. Well, the inventory went up, I mean, very slightly, but from um, March to April or April to March, the inventory went slightly up. Prices didn't go anywhere, interest rates didn't go anywhere, but there are f a few more homes. And talking to other realtors, we all see like, okay, there's a little bit more inventory out there, like a little bit, um, not, not not a ton, not significant. Like, you know, if, if let's say, I don't know, let's talk this, if Malibu had 128 listings on the market, uh, they now have 146. So it's not like it's it's so much, but it's it's enough. You know, at this, at this point in the, this market, I'll take whatever hope you know, is presented. And so what advice do you give to, uh, I guess, buyers that are out there and strategy in terms of buying? Do I kick the tires? Do I go in low and hope I get a deal on something and then just take my time and be careful? Or is it, look, if you find the house that you really like, let's figure out if we can creatively structure something that makes sense for you. It's a combination of both, to be honest. I think buyers are taking their time right now. They are seeing a bunch of things. They're non-committal. Uh, it's very, it's very interesting. Um, I, I always joke that buying a house is kind of like dating, you know, until you decide you want to commit, you're never going to find the right one. But I think there's such a hesitation because interest rates are high. They want to make sure they don't, they're not making a mistake. What I tell my clients are, look, if there's a house that kind of clicks all your boxes, that's at 70%, we should go see it because that means there was something about it that attracted to you to it. And I think with the biggest thing with buyers is getting people in the car, showing them property, letting them see things so they can try it on. You know, they can feel it. They're like, can, can they envision their life in this house? That's really important because again, going back to sort of the emotional thing, if they're emotionally connected to something, they'll figure out a way to make it happen. And then it's about you as a professional, making sure that in my back pocket, I have lenders that they could work with that I know could get them into this for a uh, payment that's palatable for them. So as a realtor, you always have to have that going on. You have to know like, w what can we get this, setting realistic expectations, getting people out, making them feel part of the process, because otherwise they're sitting behind a computer typing in a random house into Zillow with a market interest rate, with a payment that's something much more than they probably would if they found a proper mortgage broker who could find the right product for them. Yeah. I mean, I think, it, it, you know, in a nutshell, it's expect it's managing expectations and it's making somebody feel good about the deal itself uh, on top of the fact they have to like the product that they're buying. Uh, sure. And so 
Look, uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, you coming on. Paul's waving at me like uh, he's got to go to lunch or something uh, early. <laughs> and so we're, we're as, as always, we run out of time. We could do this all day. Um, and But I do appreciate uh, your insight and your input uh, and uh, certainly wish you and uh, your team much continued success, not only on the real estate side of things, but also with uh, the entertainment aspect of it as well. And um, we appreciate you coming on and, and uh, glad to have you with us and, and sharing your input. Well, thank you so much for your time and I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, you are charged. So uh, also uh, what I want to say is uh, the website, if people want to find out more about your team or about you, what's a website that they can go to to check you out? Sure, you can go to yowercharlie.com. That's Y-A-W-A-R-C-H-A-R-L-I-E.com. You can check out my Instagram, which is a very good uh, depiction of who I am as a person, a realtor, except professional, and that's at Yower Charlie. And then for the Aaron Kerman Group, you can go to our website at akg.re.com. Great. So uh, for all the folks out there who are listening in and, and viewing, uh, we appreciate uh, you checking it out. I hope you took some uh, notes and you took some uh, important takeaways from today's show. I'm Barry Saywitz, president of the Saywitz Company. Uh, we'll be back here next Tuesday talking more real estate. Thanks for tuning in. Well, there you have it. You've been listening to Let's Talk Real Estate, your weekly BS with Barry Saywitz about the current state of the real commercial real estate market right here in Southern California. On Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio, streaming live from our studio here at the University of California Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.